My wife and I have a seven-year-old daughter and a two-year-old daughter. And so we find ourselves watching the same movies over and over again, with the exception of maybe whenever a new Disney movie comes out. We'll watch that, and then that becomes part of the repetitious uh, cycle of movies and shows to watch over and over. And one of the more recent Disney movies, Encanto, uh, is one that we've now watched many times. I don't even know how many times, but, you know, for the most part, my wife and I now, we're not really watching it. Right? Our, even our daughters, they're not really watching it at this point. They've seen it so many times, but they just like for it to be on and then they'll color or something like that. Or play with each other while the movie's on in the background. And uh, one of the more one of the recent times that I rewatched Encanto, it really dawned on me the some of the biblical parallels, and it, whether or not these biblical parallels w w were put there on purpose does not matter at all. Um, the fact is that they are there, and. The movie, I believe, has a very good moral message to it, as uh, many Disney movies do, many kids' movies in general, or kids' shows. They have some sort of lesson in them, or set of lessons. And uh, with Encanto, though, it was I was pretty surprised uh, the last, last couple of times that I watched it. And, so I guess I'll just get right to it. The biblical parallels that I, that I see in Encanto. So, this is going to have spoilers in it for Encanto if you haven't seen it yet. So, you know, maybe skip this for now if you don't want to be spoiled. I do highly recommend the movie, so um, if you plan on seeing it and you don't want to be spoiled for it, you know, maybe hold off on watching the rest of this until you've watched the movie. But, um... Alright. So in Encanto, there's this family, the Madrigals, and they live in a, a sort of enchanted house, right? This house that is alive. And along with that, um, members of the family, certain members of the family have, uh, are blessed with specific gifts. So some of them, or like one of them is super strong, one of them can just make flowers appear, one of them can hear the slightest sound, one of them has a gift of prophecy, uh, and so on. So, some members of the family have gifts, and each of them that do have gifts have specific kinds of gifts. So, the, no two, no two, uh, family members have the same gift, which is, which is interesting in itself, but that's besides the point. So, as time goes on in the movie, uh, you find out that one of the kids that one of the family members who should have been blessed with a gift was not for some reason. All right, there's this process by which you are blessed with your gift, and when it came time for her, this is Maribel, when it came time for her to receive her gift, it didn't happen. And so a lot of the movie is kind of this tension between Maribel struggling with not being blessed with a gift and watching her family as they go about their days using their gifts, which um, you get little glimpses that you know, she's kind of envious. Um, she's kind of looks down on herself because she doesn't have a gift. Uh, some members of the family, in particular the grandmother, look down on her because she doesn't have a gift. And so she feels outcasted. 
and the one family member, one of her uh, cousins, ha that has the gift of making things beautiful, right? She can make flowers appear everywhere, and so she can just make everything around her beautiful. She's kind of the golden child of the family, and Maribel is the outcast, right? Because she doesn't have a gift. So there's a real tension between the, those two. Um, and you get indications here and there that they even kind of have a sort of animosity between each other and arguably they are enemies of each other in the movie. And that's, that's important for some of the biblical parallels that, that I'll bring up. Alright. So, this family, the Madrigals, they live in this house, which is enchanted. Uh, the house itself is alive and can do things, and each member of the family has gifts, except for Maribel. And as time goes on, there is... Um, for some reason, the house begins to show signs of wear, so it's like cracking and stuff like that, where that's never happened before. And some of the people who have gifts are struggling to use their gift. So the, the person who's very strong is having difficulty lifting things, um, and so on. There's other people who are struggling with, with their gift as well. So, um, so you, you see over time throughout the movie, the house is starting to break down, the people's gifts are starting to fall apart. And as that happens, the tensions between Maribel and the rest of her family grow, and in particular the tension between Maribel and her grandmother. Because the grandmother is kind of the uh, matriarch of the family. Right? It's just kind of the head of the family. And she blames Maribel for everything that's happening. For the house deteriorating and for people losing their, their gifts. And she blames Maribel because Maribel doesn't have a gift. Right? So it's not anything in Maribel's character or anything like that that the grandmother is upset with. She's upset because Maribel isn't using, it doesn't have a gift, and so there must be something wrong with her that's causing all these problems. And as that tension grows, the breakdown of the house intensifies. The house really starts to crumble and shake, and people's gifts really start to falter, until eventually, uh, the house ultimately crumbles and everybody loses their giftings. And so, what happens is, as that's about to happen, as the, the house is about to finally fully crumble, Maribel and the grandmother uh, have it out with each other. Right? So, the grandmother bl blatantly, explicitly blames everything on Maribel, right to her face, in front of the whole family. And Maribel gives it right back to the grandmother and saying that, essentially, she's, she doesn't care about the family, she only cares about the gifts and the, the, the powers of the house, right? She doesn't care about the actual individuals that make up the family. She's more concerned about the enchantment. And after everything crumbles, and the gifts disappear, then the grandmother breaks down this, uh, she breaks down and she apologizes to Maribel, and they reunite. And not only that, but shortly before that, what put the grandmother over the edge was that Maribel and the golden child, the, the girl who could make everything beautiful, they finally uh, reconciled in their relationship. 
and it was a sort of messy, fun, sloppy reconciliation, right? There's crazy flowers everywhere, all these things that... It was kind of this, uh... It was a change from the tradition. This new use of the golden child's powers that was only possible through reconciliation with Maribel, who doesn't have a gift. The outcast child, the black sheep. All right, so Maribel and the golden child, her enemy, they reconcile. Right after they reconcile, the grandmother uh, takes everything out on Maribel. Maribel gives it back to her, kind of disrespectfully, right? But they, they have it out with each other. The house crumbles. Then Maribel and the grandmother, now that all of the enchantment is gone, all they're left with is each other, and the grandmother kind of comes to her senses and remembers the, the, the true foundation of the family, what's underneath, what it, what it really means to be a family. And then through that, um, the, the enchantment is able to return. Right? Through the reconciliation of Maribel and her grandmother and through the raw, sort of giftless, um, passionate reconciliation among all family members, the house is able to be rebuilt and the enchantment returns. And the last time, the last couple times I saw this, it immediately made me think of in 1 Corinthians, where um, I think it's Paul says that even if you do all these signs and wonders, basically, if you do all of these uh, works of the Spirit, use these gifts of the Spirit, healing, prophecy, all of that, but you lack love, then those gifts are nothing to you, right? They mean nothing. Which is kind of, kind of, uh, amazing, right? You think... And, and also this is, this is shown in the response of Jesus when, or when Jesus says, you know, people will say to me, I've done this, 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 and this in your name. I've, I've healed people. I've cast out demons. I've done this and that in your name. And Jesus will basically say to them, I don't even know who you are. It's the same, it's the same concept as the first Corinthians. It's because they are, if you're lacking love, right, then those gifts don't do you any good. They might do good for the people around you to some extent. Right? Obviously, if you, you heal somebody, that person gets to be healed and maybe come to a deeper relationship with God as a result. But if you, as the person who's the facilitator of that healing power, if you lack love as your fundamental motivating force in your life, then those healings and those movements in the spirit are of no credit to you at all. So with, with Encanto, I was really, really touched, even to the point of almost being in tears the last time I saw it. Because it, it's such a potent, kind of concentrated representation of that truth, of that biblical truth, that it's not the gifts that matter, although they are important, and they, they matter to some extent, but they are not what ultimately matters. If you can do all those things, but you neglect to allow God to make love the primary motivating force in your life, 
then your house is going to crumble. Your relationships are going to crumble. So it's not that the gifts are bad, right? It's not that it's that the, the charm of the house in Encanto was bad. It's that insofar as the people making use of the gifts in the house lacked love as their motivating force, then ultimately everything crumbles without love as the foundation. All right, you can make a house as beautiful as you want on the outside, but if the foundation is weak or corrupt or corroding, then all that beauty is just going to come crashing down. And Disney's Encanto is just a fantastic representation of that truth. And again, it does not matter to me at all if that was intended to be a connection to biblical truth. Right? What matters is that it is biblical truth. And that movie, as silly and funny and lighthearted as it is most of the time, as are most Disney movies, it has touched me and helped me to come to a deeper understanding of a biblical truth. So, I highly recommend the movie. Um, it has a great message. It's funny. And, like I said, it just highlights what I think are some very important biblical truths. So go ahead and check it out.